from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez, and this is From the South. We begin in Colombia where the Attorney General Office has issued an arrest warrant for 21 members of the National Liberation Army, or ELN. This includes Pablo Beltran, the chief negotiator for the armed group in the peace talks with the government. According to a statement issued by the judicial authority, the ELN members are accused of forced displacement and rebellion. Four other commanders are subject to arrest and nine members have already been detained. Peace talks were suspended in January after rebels attacked three police stations. Opponents of the Bolivarian government in Venezuela are stepping up their international pressure. The Lima group of Latin American countries, including Brazil, Argentina and Mexico, are set to discuss possible measures in light of Venezuela's decision to call a presidential election in April. A statement issued by Peru's foreign minister said the group will meet in Peru later on Tuesday to evaluate measures to be taken over Venezuela's political situation. Last week, the United States condemned Venezuela's election and said there are no guarantees to ensure a fair process. The Venezuelan Attorney General has condemned what he called a psychological warfare waged by the United States and its allies against Venezuela. Attorney General Tarek William Saab said their aim has been to prevent a successful outcome to talks with the opposition. He added that the country had a right to resolve its differences peacefully through elections. Today, the most dangerous superpower in the world, the United States, from Colombia has shown signs of moving troops and threatening the territorial integrity of our country. Today, we must all rise up in a single voice for the defense of Venezuela's right to live in peace, settle our differences through dialogue and the electoral debate. The Brazilian President Michel Temer has traveled to his country's border with Venezuela. He told local politicians in the state of Roraima that his government will develop a joint response coordinated with the Brazilian armed forces to deal with what he called the problem of Venezuelan refugees. Temer was met by protest in the state capital Boa Vista against his pension reforms. The fate of Julian Assange hangs in the balance. This Tuesday, a UK judge will decide whether to pursue action against the WikiLeaks founder for skipping bail. Assange lost the legal battle to have UK arrest warrant against him dropped. His lawyer then launched a new argument saying the punishment doesn't match the crime and it is not in the interest of justice to arrest and try him. But regardless of what the UK court decides, Assange's biggest concern is what the US plans to do with him. Here's why. All right, firing. Let me know when you gather. What you? Light them all up. Come on, fire. This video is called Collateral Murder. It's one of the thousands of U.S. classified documents released by WikiLeaks in 2010, showing the death of civilians at the hands of U.S. forces. I believe that if those killings were lawful under the rules of engagement, then the rules of engagement are wrong, deeply wrong. The US condemned the move, calling WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service. As Assange and his ilk make common cause with dictators today. Yes, they try unsuccessfully to cloak themselves and their actions in the language of liberty, language of liberty and privacy, but in reality, they champion nothing but their own celebrity. Their currency is clickbait, their moral compass non-existent. Despite the eight-year-long verbal campaign against Assange, the U.S. has not launched a public criminal case against him. But that doesn't mean it won't. Just last year, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions said arresting Assange is a priority. He needs an assurance that he will not be extradited to the United States to face prosecution. And the use of the United States, or the attempted use, to abuse espionage laws to silence public interest, uh, public interest publishing and it re revealing true information in the public interest is a grave threat to free speech that all, sh all of us and every state should be resisting. The problem is that the UK says it cannot grant Assange that assurance. 
And that's why Assange has been holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy for more than five years, sparking humanitarian protests. The working group maintains the arbitrary detention of Mr. Assange should be brought to an end. And um, his physical integrity and his freedom of movement should be respected. Assange and his supporters applauded the ruling, but it has done little to set him free. Today is an important victory for me and for the UN human rights system. But it by no means erases seven years of detention without charge. Ecuador has been a steady supporter of Assange, offering asylum and then citizenship in December. He had been a person under international protection for about five and a half years under the jurisdiction of the Ecuadorian state and its embassy in London. The naturalization was granted on December 12, 2017. Unfortunately for Assange, the British authorities refused to accept that Ecuadorian nationality gives him any protection. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The pre-campaign period in Mexico has concluded, but the first indigenous woman to participate in this electoral contest is continuing to reach out to the poor. More in this report. Of the National Pedagogical University is not academic. However, for these young people, the visit of Maria de Jesus Patricio, known as Marichui, the first independent candidate for the Indigenous Council of Government, is an honor. Our thesis and academic research isn't always very useful, so it's important that as a students we are here with Marichui, listening to the realities of our peoples. The testimonies of all these women, it's really great. The Student Council of the University, which trains Mexico's future teachers, had prepared days in advance to receive the message from Marichui. We are forgotten the people. 
The governments only use us for the pre-campaign period in campaigns, and they only want our votes. After this is over, they no longer remember us. The independent indigenous pre-candidate plans to represent more than just the causes of Mexico's original people with her movement. We raise the flag of the demands of women and indigenous peoples. The working class has to get ahead. It has to go into the streets and fight in different ways. The pre-campaign period ended, but Marichuy brings the message of the poorest communities to Mexico City's youth. There is only one step to overthrowing this capitalist system, to overthrowing those who have appropriated everything, who have money and power, and it is organizing this. We don't see any other way out. We have to trust in one another. According to the latest numbers, Maria de Jesus has more than 500,000 signatures to appear on the ballot on July 1st and has until February 19th to collect the 800,000 required. Even if the voice of the Indigenous Council of Government falls short, important achievements have been made, the work to visualize indigenous people. The left-wing candidate Andrés Manuel López Obrador is still leading the race. Pablo Pérez tells us more. So the pre-campaign period heat in Mexico has finally ended. Those uh, uh, who pretend to be candidates to appear in the ballots on July 1st presidential elections have presented and introduced themselves to the public, specifically, spe specifically to those registered uh, on uh, one of the many parties or coalitions which are uh, propelling them for the presidential seat. It's uh, no noticeable that the left-wing candidate, Andres Manuel López Obrador, has uh, maintained a substantial advantage over the other two candidates, uh, the one from the right-wing party, uh, National, uh, Partido Acción Nacional, Ricardo Anaya, and Jose Antonio Mead, from the Institutional Revolutionary Party, the official party. So it's uh, over 11 percentage points, the difference between Andres Manuel López Obrador and the Ricardo Anaya, who is his, its closest contender, and then comes uh, uh, José Antonio Mead. So the real fight here is for the second place. And uh, several analysts have declared how both the Anaya and Mead are part of the same agenda. They, uh, they, they propose a continuity of the neoliberal policies that have reigned over the last uh, sexenios, the last period, uh, presidential periods here in Mexico. And uh, Andrés Manuel Prodor is presenting, is proposing a different way, a more socialist, more left-wing uh, option, alternative, for the presidency in Mexico. It's the third time he goes to the presidential elections and uh, both in 2006 and in 2012, the election had been uh, classified by several analysts of being rigged by the party in the power to prevent Andrés Manuel Obrador from uh, getting to the presidential uh, seat here in Mexico. Also, uh, you have to we have to mention the uh, singularity. This is the first time that there is uh, the possibility of independent candidates here in Mexico, something that is uh, really new. And some of them got the over 800,000 signatures needed for their names on the ballot, but they are being accused of rigging or uh, say, uh, uh, getting fake signatures so, so in order to, get, uh, to register themselves as candidates. And the most uh, noticeable one, the first woman from an indigenous, uh, an indigenous people presenting her as a candidate, she is far from getting that name of, number, uh, of, of signatures, but nonetheless, she is taking part of the tours all over the country and she says that she's already won because her intentions were not, were not to participate in the elections but to, lead, uh, to take the word of the indigenous people to the rest of Mexico. That was Pablo Perez from Mexico. Femicide rates in Chile are up and feminist organizations in the country are getting ready for the International Women's Day to be celebrated next March. 
We have more details in this next story. For Chilean Network Against Violence Against Women, the situation is alarming. This year, eight femicides have occurred, together with brutal cases of abuse to little girls. There has not been proper information about violence against women. We just received gynecological reports of an 11-year-old girl. We have also received details of sexual aggression on a two-year-old girl. That is not necessary. This month, the National Day Against Violence in Relationships is celebrated after a year since Antonia Garros committed suicide. The young woman jumped from a building after a quarrel with her boyfriend. This is why activists are pushing for the establishment of a crime called Instigation to Female Suicide by promoting initiatives as a phone app for Android to help women in violent situations. Nonetheless, the legislation on the issue is far from being defined. That law is inactive. It's been 22 years since Chile promised to make it. This government at least presented a project, but that's really it. Latin America and the Caribbean are the regions with the higher rates of violence against women. It is there where feminist organizations as Ni Una Menos have achieved to go beyond borders and gather people to fight against the violence. We focus on precarious labor conditions and every kind of structure of violence towards women, the right to practice free and safe abortion and sexual and reproductive rights for women. But the panorama hasn't changed much in five years. Feminists in Chile are preparing to celebrate Women's Day with a new national march. This should recognize the actual situation. Right now it's impossible for us to tell women to stop working for one or two hours just to take part in the march without unions backing them up. With or without strikes, feminist movements will continue to fight to eradicate the violence against women in the continent and worldwide. Women's organizations in Argentina have also been preparing for the national strike set to take place on March 8. They will be protesting against gender violence and inequality. Women's organizations have denounced gender violence, which they claim is hitting the most vulnerable sectors. They blame the economic crisis and measures imposed by the current Argentinian government. The government is against the new Namenos movement. It has feminist side poverty, and for that, this is a chauvinistic and patriarchal government. The needs in the neighborhood are immense. We work to help older people, retirees, the young. We have no age limit when it comes to feeding someone or helping a neighbor. Nalida Andrada and Nadia Garcia are two women doing social work in the most vulnerable areas of Buenos Aires, a province that is only becoming poorer. Women are affected by the lack of jobs and by gender violence that comes from their husbands. We work to defend women. The poorer sectors of society are invisible because it is not profitable to show poverty. Women are twice invisible because as they have no access to other spaces in society, women in poverty are twice invisible. The poverty cycle continues because women have limited access to education, health and justice systems. Women organizations call this institutional violence. We are trying to find a way to feed everybody before they go to sleep. Just two years ago, we ran a cultural center where young people went to learn new crafts or to work with their computers. Today, they go there for food. On March 8th, women in Argentina will make their voices heard during the national strike. They will be demanding new public measures to put an end to gender violence. A major cruise ship has arrived in Dominica just in time for the first carnival since Hurricane Irma devastated the island in September. TUI Cruises made its second visit this season with another four scheduled calls to Dominica. The government has invested over $3 million in restoration of the port. Passengers were treated to a display of traditional sensei and bois bois stilt walkers. In theory, Carnival is on Monday and Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, but in Trinidad, it starts when Christmas ends. And Monday and Tuesday is the climax of the final week. We look at this lead up to the parade of the bands. The roots of Carnival is retold annually, very early on the Friday before Carnival in the back streets of the capital, Port of Spain. This street play written by Intu Springer centers on the 1881 Cambule riots and is performed near where the riots actually took place. 
as the origin of the modern Trinidad festival. Kambule is the key Congo word for procession. The colonial police were ordered to stop the procession and the people resisted, forcing an apology from the governor at the time. Stick fight! For masqueraders, parading in their custom finery along the streets of Port of Spain is not enough. The stage at the Queen's Park Savannah is where, for many, the magic is. And for the children, their day is Saturday, and their costumes are no less majestic than their adult counterparts. The music of Trinidad's carnival is calypso, steel pan, and soca. And on Saturday night, Panorama takes place. It is a concert where steel bands compete with each other to be named the best. And BPTT Renegades are the 2018 Panorama champions. The Manche Gras or Big Sunday is the name of the major Calypso competition. This year the winner was Helon Francis, which many hail as a changing of the musical guard. We could say that this nation here came from quite down there. And when the Manche Gras ends, Jovi begins. Jovi, a festival of mud and paint, formerly oil, is, as the name suggests, the start of carnival. It is a dirty, euphoric experience that keeps Trinidad's carnival anchor in its tradition of subverting Western values while honoring ancestral customs. We'll take another short break. Join us after a look at what our multimedia team is reporting. Maternal love is the love that's going to change the future of mankind. So we'd like you to... Uh, we, we like to say people kind, not necessarily mankind, because uh, yeah. it's more inclusive. There we go, exactly. <laughs> yes, thank you. We can all learn from each other. Welcome back. The British charity Oxfam is fighting to save its government funding following revelations about sexual misconduct by staff working in Haiti after the 2010's devastating earthquake. With $44 million of government funding to Oxfam hanging in the balance, senior managers were summoned to a meeting with Britain's and Minister Aid Minister Petty Mordaunt. According to Mordaunt, she will move, quote, hastily on this decision. Meanwhile, in Haiti, a prominent local lawmaker said Congress will ask the Haitian state to temporarily ban Oxfam and is calling for an investigation. We are going to ask the Haitian state, in accordance with the law, to temporarily remove Oxfam's permission and for the government to open an investigation. If the allegations are confirmed, the victims need to file a complaint. Moving ahead, let's look at some other news from around the world. After South Africa's ruling African National Congress gave President Jacob Zuma 48 hours to resign as head of the state, people have been looking forward to the new change. There has been no response from Zuma so far on his removal. But if he doesn't budge, he will have to face a vote of confidence in Parliament on the 22nd of February that he's expected to lose. 
Uh, as the economy is really crushing at the moment, uh, stability is really difficult. Uh, so yeah, I guess as uh, South African uh, in this generation, we're really hoping for the better, eh? And let's see how it goes. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un has appreciated the warm reception of the delegation to the South for the Winter Olympics. Kim also said that it is important to boost the warm climate of reconciliation and dialogue after meeting with the high-level delegation that has returned after their three-day visit to the South. Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas has told Russian President Vladimir Putin he could no longer accept the role of the United States as a mediator in talks with Israel because of Washington's behavior towards Jerusalem. Abbas also asked for Putin's support in resolving the issue. If there is some sort of an international conference, we require that it should work out a mechanism where the United States will not be a single mediator, but a part of a mediating group. A battle of oranges has started in the Italian city of Ivrea. Hundreds of people have joined the annual carnival, coloring each other with oranges. During the three-day carnival, participants are divided into two groups, commoners who are on foot and guards of the medieval lords who are transported around by carriage. And with this, we've come to the end of this morning news brief. There are many other stories. You can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.